The Marx of Marx and Spencer was Michael Marx. He came to Britain to escape the anti-Semitism of Russia-controlled Poland and arrived unable to speak a word of English. Uh, the anecdotal story is that he thought he bought a ticket to New York and they chucked him off in Hull. Uh, and uh, if he hadn't been chucked off in Hull, we wouldn't have Marx and Spencer today. It's a great sort of rags to riches story and uh, he had a chance. He was hard working, he was determined to make a mark in the UK. Starting in Leeds, he built a network of penny bazaar stalls in markets in the north of England. And when it came to prices, he was as good as his word. He put this sign on his tray which said, don't ask the price, it's a penny, because then he wouldn't have to haggle with anybody. In 1894, he joined forces with Yorkshireman Tom Spencer, who invested his life savings into the business, forming the most famous partnership in retail. Michael Marks and Tom Spencer worked brilliantly for 11 years. And then Tom Spencer decided that actually he'd made quite enough money, was quite successful, and the business rocketed. You know, the number of stores increased dramatically during that time. And he decided he'd retire. Unfortunately, he drank himself to death, but the name endured. In 1907, the business would pass into the hands of Michael Marks's son, Simon a man with grand plans. Whatever business you're in, or whatever profession you're in, there are always people who are sort of visionaries. But Simon was one of the great architects of the business. He was very, very hands-on, and he would walk around and interrogate people and ask them questions. He would also, if there was something he didn't like, he would throw the garments to the floor and shout, you're trying to ruin my business business he was fighting desperately to expand. Marx believed there was an untapped middle market for low-priced, high-quality, fashionable clothing. But back then, stores still bought their wares from wholesalers, slowing down the buying process and making quality control difficult. But then Marx had a genius idea. They would do a lot better if they could buy directly from suppliers and that they would also have much more control over the product. This had never been tried before. But despite fierce opposition from wholesalers threatening to blacklist those who dealt with M&S Direct, Simon Marks persuaded Cora, a Leicester company, to trade with him directly. And of course, uh, the rest is history because what happened was they were able to reduce prices increase volumes coming through the factories, reinvest that back into better pricing, better quality, and subsequently into innovation and uh, design and whatever else. That is how M&S established itself and really left its competitor standing. In the 1960s, the brand used a teenage sensation from North London as the star of its clothing ads. Probably the biggest fashion icon in our country, virtually a national treasure. In the 60s, Twiggy was the most sought-after model in the world. Hired by M&S, she introduced Britain to the miniskirt. Um, our shortest miniskirt was 16 inches long, which in those days, everybody's eyebrows were raised. I remember the board coming round and saying, we can't sell skirts as short as that, they're obscene. Twiggy not only made it an acceptable part of a young woman's wardrobe, but an essential one. They sold out immediately and we didn't look back. 30 years later, Twiggy would return as one of the faces of M&S, thanks to a chance encounter. I was having lunch in the Adnams Crown Hotel in Southwold and Twiggy walked in. She had pigtails, a woolly hat, no makeup and looked sensational. It was a light bulb moment, so I didn't say anything. I rang her agent the next morning, and she was on board. Twiggy is kind of every woman, and she's been around for decades, and, but she has an appeal that goes across the generations. So I think that's where her real strength as a, a brand spokeswoman lies for Marks & Spencers. Twiggy's comeback was a huge success for her and the company. The cream blouse she wore in this 2005 ad became the fastest selling M&S item ever. In recent years, other famous faces from the fashion world have joined her. 
from Claudia Schiffer and Linda Evangelista to Christy Turlington and Rosie Huntington-Whiteley. M&S has used male models too. When David Gandhi advertised a men's underwear range, it proved so popular, it soon appeared in a whole new department. We're actually bringing out some, um, some smaller sizes for women next season. The M&S tradition of selling has long played to the public's deepest desires. Its founder had a natural understanding of what customers found appealing. Michael Marx was a brilliant entrepreneur and businessman. After a decade of peddling his goods on the streets of Leeds, Marx opened his first premises. He painted the sign admission free over the door to encourage people to pop in and browse the products. Products that were clearly displayed. And he realized that by doing that, you actually got a much higher turnover because once people saw the goods, they were much more tempted to buy. It was a completely different model from the keep your store locked, keep the goods below the counter until a customer came in. So this was a revolutionary new way of retailing. In the 1930s, M&S was again breaking new ground, this time with its policies. Back then, changing rooms were rare which meant customers had to take clothes home without being able to try them on. M&S were the first to allow them to return or exchange any items they had bought with no questions asked. You could always return things um, and there was never really any time limit either. As long as it was still new and resaleable, we would take things back. So they encouraged us to actually take the merchandise home, try it on, and just bring it back if we weren't happy for whatever reason. I can remember actually being in the store when I was a supervisor and someone returning something that they'd been given three years ago. <laughs> and, you know, they said that they don't fit them anymore or they've put on weight or whatever, and you couldn't really sort of argue with it. You'd have to give them a refund because that was Marks and Spencer's policy. <laughs> Well, looking back on it, I think, my goodness, they were really generous <laughs> because nowhere else would have done that. For many, it's all-round customer service that's given M&S an edge over the years. When my children were small, I shopped every single day in Marks and & Spencers and the staff used to look after the kids so that I could do a trolley dash and buy all the food um, because I used to struggle with two small babies, but the staff used to help me out entertain the kids, play with the kids, watch them, and I could go around and they would help me to pack my bags and take them out to the car. I really value the, the um, personal service that they offer. The value of those working on the shop floor was something Simon Marks, the founder's son, understood fully. And although he could be a fearsome boss, he was famed for looking after them. One day he was in the store, I think it was in Huddersfield, early in the morning, and he was talking to a young sales assistant and she fainted. And he went to say, are you all right, my dear? And he found out that she hadn't had any breakfast. And he said, well, why haven't you had any breakfast? And she was giving all her money to her family because they were unemployed. Within a couple of days, introduced breakfast to anybody who was in by seven o'clock. And that was still in place when I joined the business. He learned that there were employees who just didn't have the wealth to feed themselves. He immediately initiated free meals for all his staff. Simon Marsh called it enlightened self-interest. Basically, if I look after my staff, they will look after me. In the 70s, when I had first started working there, we used to have a hairdresser there all the time. There was a doctor who'd come every two weeks. A dentist would come every six months. You know, we all loved working there. Apart from anything else, it was a great social um, life as well, if you like. You know, everyone was like a big family. Many of Simon Marks's policies have remained in place to this day, even though his own stewardship ended in 1964. They helped build a company that, towards the end of the 20th century, was making high street history. In 1998, it became the first British retailer to post a pre-tax profit of a billion pounds.